in this room, if a movie comes up on the television and the characters of the movie break out into song and dance, you have that just cringe and instant thought, oh no, <laughs> it's a musical. <laughs> And they're going to do that randomly throughout the rest of the movie. I'm not a huge fan of musicals, maybe a few, uh, nor am I a huge fan of plays. But when I was in high school, I loved reading William Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. It's part of the curriculum then, it was. I trust it very well could be, I guess, today. But it was an amazing play. And the reason that I loved that play so much was because of one relationship. There's a relationship between the main character, Brutus, and his wife, Portia. I had a lot of respect for them and the way they respected one another, the way that they honored one another, the way that they found identity in one another. It was unique, really a significant thing. And it came out in the story. It was so obvious within the entire story how much they loved each other and the identity that they found in each other. I want you to consider that identity just for a moment as we consider the identity we find, not only in each other, but the identity here at this table that we find in Christ. It's the most significant identity you can have. There's a time when Brutus was very bothered. If you remember the story, if you've read Julius Caesar, or if you haven't, let me tell you just a bit about the plot. Brutus comes up with a plot to overthrow Caesar, to overthrow Julius Caesar, to kill him. Now, he's described actually by a first century historian as the embodiment of patriotism itself. I mean, this guy, if he believed in something, he was going to pursue it to the nth degree. And he believed that Julius Caesar was an emperor, a ruler, who was doing things that were not right for the people. And he believed that it was important that he overthrow the C uh, Julius Caesar. And so he came up with this conspiracy, came up with this plot. He was a man that would never, never do anything, never join a bandwagon. But if he initiated it, he would see it through to the end. And if he wasn't going to have liberty, in essence, from his concept, his perspective, he would have death. Brutus was bothered by his conscience at night. And Portia continually had to try and reassure him, though he swore an allegiance to the fellow conspirators to not say a word. He swore secrecy. The Brutus or Portia would come to him often and say, what is bothering you? Because he wouldn't sleep. Why are you up at night breathing in the coal airs? Is this a sickness? Would Brutus not come by the remedy? This is sickness of heart, she would say, heaviness of heart in the, in the, in the play. She wanted to know what was bothering him so much, and she constantly tried to to appeal to him, tell me what's bothering you. I will help bear this burden, she would say within the play. At one point, he merely just with his hand dismissed her. It was the first gesture of talk to the hand in history. But out of respect, she actually left him, not wanting to further anger him. But she returned, and she returned to him with two reasons why she believed that she could handle this information, why she could endure this Thing that bothered him so much. She said, number one, she said, I'm, this, I'm the daughter of a man named Cato. I can take this, Brutus, because I'm the daughter of Cato. Cato was a man well-respected among the people. He was a man revered. He was a public figure. And she said, number two, I'm the wife of Brutus. She said, I can take this information. I can help you endure. You chose me. She found identity in her man really a unique situation. She said, how could you think of me any less being so fathered and so husbanded? I want you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Now, don't get me wrong. I want you to go home. I want you to read your Bibles. <laughs> you don't have to read William Shakespeare to get this point. But I love that statement. How could you think of me less being so fathered and so husbanded? God is our heavenly father. 
And Christ is the head of the church. And I want you to see the analogy here in Ephesians chapter 5. And verse 25, husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. We come to this table and we actually find a significant identity. And that is in the fact that the heavenly father up in heaven has adopted us as sons. We can call him father, in fact. But also, we are part of his ecclesia, his church, which Christ died for. How could you think of yourselves any less being so fathered and so husbanded? We being a part of that church, we being a part of the group and the body that Christ gave himself for. Let's think of Jesus. Let's think of what he did for us on the cross. And let's think of the identity that we can have in him being so fathered and so husbanded. Please bow your heads. Oh, Lord, we're thankful for your son, Jesus. We believe that he died on a cross to save us from our sins. He endured that shame. He shed his blood so that we can have a chance, a hope, an a opportunity to have a relationship with you and someday be with you in heaven. And we think about him this morning. We have great identity in your son, Jesus. He saved us and we can have a relationship with him and you because of his death. Thank you, O Lord, for this bread, which represents his body. Help us to think upon Jesus and all the things that he does for us continually, but especially what he did on the cross. In his name we pray. Amen.